As we are here to worship God on the last day of Unleavened Bread, I want to ask you a question. Brethren, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice? To be in God's kingdom, to live this way of life, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. What are you personally willing to To sacrifice. Now, I know that's a heavy question, but I think it's worth considering as we observe this holy day, especially in light of of what we think about on these holy days and have been thinking for the last seven days. You know, when you look at individuals in the Bible who've had to sacrifice something for God's way of life, It's not hard to find individuals for the list. The Bible is full of of people who sacrificed for God or his people in his way of life and to attain the kingdom, the resurrection. Jeremiah was told when he was a servant of God and he was in his ministry, he said, you shall not take a wife nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place because God said, because of all the calamities that will be happening in Jerusalem. So his sacrifice was he would never have a family in, in, in that way, in this life. The apostles James and John and Peter and Andrew all walked away from their business. They were partners in a fishing business, and they, they walked away. The apostle Levi or Matthew walked away from probably a, a very lucrative position as a tax collector. It said of Paul in Acts, 19, uh, Acts 9.15 that, uh, that he would have to suffer many, many things in the service of God. He would have to sacrifice. And truly, when we look at the life of Paul, his life was not easy, was it? Eventually, he gave his life. Abraham was called upon to sacrifice his son Isaac. Genesis 22 and verse 1, it says, The Lord said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. How's that for a sacrifice? Now we know that at the last possible second, he was stopped and he didn't have to, but he was willing to. One of the most difficult sacrifices you can imagine, un- unthinkable, unfathomable as a, as a father or a mother. And yet, for God's plan and his reasons, and as it, Mr. Meredith explained, you know, in times past, uh, this was not just sort of a voice in the dark telling Abraham to sacrifice his son. He knew who the eternal was, and he knew exactly who was talking to him, and he knew that he could resurrect him as well. But still, what a sacrifice. Certainly the biggest sacrifice of all, and and a theme that runs through the Bible, is the sacrifice of the Messiah who gave his life for us. We reviewed that at the Passover. We've talked about that. Let's turn over to John Uh, chapter 3, and verse 16, not only did Jesus sacrifice, but the Father did as well. We read this a little while ago, but let's turn there again, John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's quite profound to look and see at the sacrifice, to look at the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made as well as his Father made to be our Savior, for Christ to be our Savior. And we think about that during the Passover. As we've heard, the days of unleavened bread are our response to the Passover. The Passover is is about Christ's sacrifice for us. 
But these days teach us what our response should be to that sacrifice. And in particular, this afternoon, I'd like to ask the question, what would you be willing to sacrifice? If you want a title, I've entitled this sermon, Become a Living Sacrifice. Become a Living Sacrifice. Let's talk about sacrificing. This week we've been eating unleavened bread, and so we have sacrificed our normal fare, haven't we? The good bread we normally eat, and rolls, and whatever, donuts, and crackers, and cookies, and cake, and pie, whatever, whatever it is that you enjoy in that wonderful leavened uh, bread, we've sacrificed that for seven days, haven't we? That's what we've been doing the last, the last week. Now, at first glance, this, this might seem to be a fairly ordinary thing. It's not that big of a deal to give up, uh, you know, a certain type of food for a short period of time. That's not that big of a sacrifice, right? You don't win any medals for that. But if it's so easy, then why aren't more people doing it? If it's not a big deal, then why isn't the whole world doing it? Because after all, the first century church was keeping these days. Notice in 1 Corinthians, let's turn over there, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, the short answer is most church-going people in this world assume that these holy days are just part of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and just like the sacrifices, the washings uh, are not done today, they think the holy days aren't to be kept either. And yet there's clear evidence the early church kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, notice in verse... Verse 7, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Now some people say, well this is just speaking spiritually, he was just saying, you know, that, that you're, you're unleavened, well you're spiritualizing away. Well, clearly when you look at the whole context of the book, they were not spiritually unleavened. There was infighting, there was backbiting, there was power-seeking, there was arguing, debating. They were puffed up. Paul says that a number of times. Clearly, they were not spiritually unleavened, so the only possibility is they were physically unleavened. And Paul said, you need to become spiritually unleavened. So this is one of the most clear cases and in places we see in the New Testament that shows that the New Testament church kept the holy days. So we keep this day. We keep this feast. Now, is the issue really bread? Is that really the big deal, the physical leavening? Well, in uh, backing up a little bit, uh, verse 6, this is, of course, breaking into the context of the, the, the man who was uh, in, engaged in immora, immorality, and so Paul was dealing with this, but he said, verse 6, Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. So he was saying that you got rid of your physical leaven. Now you need to be spiritually deleavened. Going on, it says, let us keep the feast, verse 8, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we know leaven symbolizes sin, and we are to get rid of it, just like yeast spreads, ferments. Sin will also spread in our life if we don't get rid of it. So what are we really to sacrifice? Is it only the donuts? Is it only the bread and the rolls and the crackers and the cookies? Well, we know, yes, we are to put those out, but they represent something bigger. 
God is intending that we are sacrificing our human nature during these days. There's something bigger. So, brethren, what are you willing to sacrifice during these days and beyond? John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Let's turn over there. We read this at Passover, but i just like to touch on it a little bit here in light of what we're talking about. John chapter 6, Jesus was speaking to the Jews about physical bread and about spiritual bread. Uh, he said in... Um, let's, let's pick it up in verse 30. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, stop and think about this for a moment. This is not long after he had just fed 5,000 people, 5,000 men, with five barley loaves and two small fish. And the crowds were following him because he was feeding them. They were wanting the food. He said, you're not really looking for the, the miracles, the signs. You just want another lunch. And so now these men were telling him, what sign will you do? After he had just done this incredible sign. Brethren, you know, when we stop and think about the profound arrogance, the profound sarcasm, the profound cynicism of these men that Jesus had to deal with when he was on this earth. It really highlights the sacrifice of his even being here. Just having to deal with people like this every day. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, keep going in verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The manna was symbolic. The manna was just a representation of the Messiah coming to give his life for mankind. Notice in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. All, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So now he was talking about feeding on the true bread, getting out the, unle the, the leavened bread, getting out the sin, sacrificing the sin, but also in taking the true bread, the unleavened bread. That's what we've been doing, haven't we? It's not the days of no bread. It's the days of unleavened bread. And he was explaining that here. He says, notice in um, verse 47, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. He's the bread. He's the one. He's the, the unleavened bread. All week we've been eating unleavened bread. It's symbolizing him. It's symbolizing feeding on him. As he said, verse 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Verse 56, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. So we've been abstaining from leavened bread for seven days, and we've been feeding on unleavened bread. For seven days, which pictures spiritually feeding on Christ. So let's think about Christ's sacrifice for us. I think there's, there are a few places that describe his sacrifice in total better than Philippians chapter 2. 
Philippians chapter 2 and verse, verse 5. Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We're going to talk about this for a little while here. Because you notice the whole verse, there's a lot in there, isn't there? And the death at the stake only comes at the end. It was only the end of his sacrifice. His giving his life was only the last part of his sacrifice. Just what did Jesus sacrifice to come down to this earth, brethren? Think about it. You know, in 1 Peter, you don't have to turn there, uh, but 1 Peter 1, verse 18, it says he was ordained before the foundation of the world. You know the plan, it, in another place it says before time began, he was slain. How long was this plan in motion? How long was the word thinking about what he would do for you and me? We don't even know. It'd be before time began, when was that? How long is that? Our Savior has been, was preparing for the sacrifice that he would make for a long, long time. And just coming here to be a human was a sacrifice in itself. You know, think about what it would be like to live in the God realm to have the power over the angels, to have the creative power to create worlds, to create the sun, to create the earth, the moon, the stars, everything, to create the multiverse. Sorry, no, there is no multiverse. Just think about the power of a God being at his fingertips, the power that he had. We understand Jesus Christ, the Word, was the one who created all things. Let's, let's pull a few things out of this here as we step back a little bit. Let's look at it piece by piece. Verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That is, that is such a... Sort of an awkward translation. It, what does that mean? It's very hard to understand. There are other translations that put it differently. In the English Standard Version, it says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, though he was at the Godhead from eternity past, he did not think that that was something that he had to hold on to when he thought about the plan, when he thought about us, when he thought about what he would do for the potential children of God, he did not hold on to that power that he had, even though he was at the throne of God and even though he was a part of the Godhead. You know, that's really interesting because as human beings... Isn't it true that um, grasping things is something we, we are very good at? We come out of the womb basically grabbing things, don't we? As was said earlier, we, we have a lot of babies in this congregation. And uh, what are babies really good at? You know, one of the first things, as soon as they're sort of aware of their, their surroundings, they reach out and they want to grab, right? And that's a good thing. It's healthy. It means they're, they're functioning. They are beginning to, to understand their, their surroundings. They like to grab things, and then they like to put it in their mouth. You know. 
And isn't it true that in one sense, our life as a child growing up is learning to, okay, stop grabbing everything and start sharing. Right? You don't get the swing first. Let your friend have it first and take turns, right? Sadly, some people never learn that. Some people go through life still grabbing for power, for money, for material wealth, for status. But Jesus wasn't like that at all. He was willing to let it go. He was willing to let go of the most valuable thing of all, and that was being at the Godhead itself. It says, he made himself of no reputation. What does that mean? Well, this word, uh, there, one of the root words here is kinos, or literally emptied himself. I think Mr. Strain referred to this this morning a little bit. He emptied himself. Now, again, let's think about this. Way before Jesus Christ gave his life at the stake, way before he was beaten and scourged and stabbed and, and his blood poured out, and he breathed his last, way before that, he emptied himself to become a human being. He sacrificed himself. He sacrificed his place at the throne of God. There was absolutely no selfishness. There was absolutely no self-centeredness in him. He emptied himself. Again, think about what that entailed. This was not a light thing because of where he was and what he possessed and the power he had. And why did he do it? Why did he empty himself? Well, because he loved you and he loved me. And also he loves Vladimir Putin. And he loves Xi Jinping. And he loves the premier of North Korea and the president of Iran and everyone, doesn't he? And that's why he was willing to empty himself, sacrifice, not just his life, not just his body being broken, but the fact that he was here in the first place. Brethren, what are you willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to sacrifice? To sacrifice. We don't even come close to having anything of value compared to what Christ sacrificed and gave up. Going on, it says here, um, then verse, uh, verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. We'll stop right there. We, we've talked about to the point of death. But he became obedient. He was with the Father and lived for all eternity. But he took a back seat. He, took, he played second fiddle. You know what, as they say, the hard, hardest instrument in the orchestra? Second fiddle. It's hard to not be number one, isn't it? It always feels good to be taking the, the lead. But it's hard to, to take a back seat, especially in our day. Especially because, you know, we glorify pride. You've got to be in front. You've got to be a leader. You've got to be confident. You've got to stand up for your rights. Now, I'm not suggesting we let people run over us. I'm not suggesting we are become a doormat. But, you know, our society has taken it to such an extreme. Vanity, self-promotion has become a trait of Western society, and maybe we could say particularly of American Western society, the worship of the self, the glorification of the self. But Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Again, brethren, what are we sacrificing? Are we willing to sacrifice our self-will? Are we willing to be obe obedient? Are we willing to humble ourselves, you know, in whatever situation we find ourselves, to our parents, to our boss, to those in authority over us? Can we humble ourselves and submit to one another? I was at a gas station. My wife and I were at a gas station a few weeks ago, and 
<clears throat> she went inside, and uh, while I was filling up, um, it was pretty pretty busy, pretty crowded, a lot of cars going and, and coming. And two people a couple of bays down got into a shouting match. And you know what the issue was? One person was filling up his car, his truck, and the next person was trying to get into the other pump but could not reach it because the first person had parked a little too far down the driveway. And so the second person yelled at him, get out of the way. And so he said, just calm down. I'll be done in a second. It'll be fine. Then the other person, you calm down. And he's, yeah, oh yeah? Well, you calm I mean, it was ridiculous. These were grown adults. And it made me think I was back in high school. Because I've seen this before, been there before. But I began to think, somebody's going to pull out a gun and shoot somebody here. Because that's the way our people are now. You don't let anyone get an advantage over you. Thankfully, it finally, somebody finally had the sense to not have the last word. You know, for a while, everybody wants the last word, and it just keeps escalating. Finally, someone just stopped, and, and it calmed down. But where are we in our society? And brethren, how much does it rub off on us? The point is, when our Savior was on this earth, he didn't just give up his life. He gave his life, not just on the stake, but the whole time he was here, just by becoming human. Is it any surprise that that's where we're going? Is it any surprise that that's what's expected, that we would become a living sacrifice? Because that's what he was willing to do. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, for those in the children's Bible class. Yes, this is a memory scripture. So you can count it down on your paper and tell Mrs. Lyons later. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable. It's not unusual. It's not beyond our capacity. It's not unthinkable. Frankly, it's what, what he was willing to do, but he did way more because he started... <laughs> with way more power than we ever have. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, we, we may have to give up our lives physically someday, and at baptism we, we make that commitment that with God's help we would do that if we have to, if that is required of us. But even more importantly, we could say, how are we living our life today, right now? Are we living as a living sacrifice right now? Mr. Weston has often explained, how do you prepare for more difficult trials ahead? And as we heard in the sermonette a little while ago, well, one of the best indicators of what we'll be able to do tomorrow is what we're doing today. If we're living as a living sacrifice today, we'll be able to face the trials that we have tomorrow. And God will help us. And maybe even if we're willing to prove to him that we're willing to go all out now, and we're willing to go through fiery trials now, in our life now, and we're willing to lay down our lives now, Maybe we'll, we can show him our commitment and our dedication and our loyalty and our zeal so we don't have to go through some of the things later. We can have protection if we're willing to sacrifice now. I, I remember a, a college professor and minister 
that we had when I was in my early 20s gave us a memorable quote I've never forgotten. If you take care of your character, God will take care of your skin. If you take care of your character, God will take care of your skin. If we're willing to be a living sacrifice now, maybe we won't have to be tested in the same way down the road. Matthew chapter 19 and verse verse 16. Let's turn over there. Matthew chapter 19. This is the the story of, not just the story, but the relating of, of an account of something that happened. And Jesus was was there, and this young man came, a ruler, and said to him in Matthew 19 and verse 16, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. In other words, it seems to be implying that this young man knew knew he was God, knew he was from God, and he was God in the flesh. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, it appears that Jesus would have left it if, at that if the young man had left it at that. In other words, if this young man would have had the discernment to understand that what Christ was saying was all-encompassing, he's saying, look, I, I want your, your total obedience. You need to keep God's law. What does the law say? You need to keep the law, but not just in the letter, in the spirit as well. And you think if the young man would have had discernment to say, wow, help me to do that because I sin. If that's what's required, I sin every day and I need help so that I can control even my mind so I can accomplish and do your will. That's what the, remember the, the parable of the, the Pharisee and the publican? The publican said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and he went down to his house justified. It seems like if this young man had had a little more discernment about what Christ was saying, he would have, this would have been where it was left at. But no, instead, look at what, look at what happened. The young man said to him, verse 20, All these things I've kept for my youth, what do I still lack? In other words, you know what? I've checked all the boxes. And in fact, I've been checking all the boxes all my life. I've got this down. I, 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 I know what I'm doing. So, so give me another one, right? Pretty confident in uh, his ability and where he stood with God. So, so Christ really laid down the gauntlet. He said, okay, if that's the way it is, if that's how you feel, I'm going to make it very clear that I'm talking about total commitment. Jesus said, verse 21, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And of course, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say this to everyone, and you don't see in the New Testament everyone being required to give up all their possessions and give them all to the poor. Now, we have to be willing to. They have to be willing to if necessary, but he didn't tell everyone this. He, he said it in this particular case to make a point because this young man was not understanding that we have to sacrifice. We have to be a living sacrifice. It's not just about keeping a few laws to the letter, but it's about sacrificing the self. And we don't have to, God doesn't require us to give up every possession we have. He does say we have to be willing to, if 
necessary. Notice in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. What he's looking for is an attitude. He's looking for is a willingness. He's looking for is, am I putting God and pleasing God above all else? Possessions, people, whatever. Luke chapter 14 and verse, uh, notice in verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. He doesn't, he doesn't require us to forsake our marriages, take a vow of poverty, and walk away from all of our possessions. But he does say we must be willing to if called upon. You know, he, he uses the, the relationships we have. He uses the possessions we have to teach us lessons. But if a relationship or a possession or an idea or an opinion becomes a God to us, if it takes on more value than him, then that's a problem. And he's going to test us on that. And he might even take it away. And we must be willing to give up anything if necessary. And that is an attitude of being a living sacrifice. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and verse... Verse 29, verse 28, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, as we heard this morning in the sermon. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. God must come first. And just like Jesus didn't grasp for his position at the Godhead, God is telling us we must not grasp for things or possessions or people or our opinion or our own will, but be willing to let it go. Malachi has an interesting take on this topic. Let's turn over to Malachi. When we speak of being a sacrifice and being willing to sacrifice, Malachi was written over 400 years before Christ, and the generation that he was writing to had some very serious problems. They were performing sacrifices at the temple, they were offering on the Sabbath, they were keeping the Sabbath and the Holy Days, but there was something terribly wrong. Malachi 1 verse 6, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but... You say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? You know, when you go to a world leader, when you go to uh, someone in a, in a uh, position of authority, you don't just go any way you want. You have to observe protocol, and in certain cases, you have to bring a gift. Otherwise, you don't see that, that, uh, that leader, that authority. Um, and, and God is saying, you're not even giving me the respect to a worldly leader. Notice in verse 
Uh, verse 12, but you profane it in, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. You sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. What was happening here? He's saying they were giving the castoffs. They were giving the, the things of no value. They were giving the things that were sick. They were giving the things they couldn't use. They were even stealing from their neighbor to, <laughs> to offer something. Was God pleased with that? You know, it reminds me, Mr. O'Gwen used to tell the story uh, of the man uh, who every, every Lent uh, would give up. Well, first of all, in, you know, this is in southern Louisiana, heavily Catholic, so every Lent people have to give up something, and this particular man would uh, give up watermelon at Lent. Of course, Lent is in the springtime, and watermelon isn't in season, so you can't even get watermelon. So, uh, so what kind of sacrifice is it to give up watermelon in March? You can't even find a watermelon. Brethren, are there times when we feel like we're sacrificing? We think we're sacrificing, but the thing of value we're giving, it's not really a sacrifice. It, it doesn't really pinch. We don't really feel discomfort when we give it. You know, if there's not a little bit of discomfort, then maybe it's not a sacrifice. In this case, you know, if, if they gave the best of their herd, if they gave a prize bull, for example, you know, if, if, you're a, if you raise cattle or sheep or a livestock of some time and you give a really good animal, that... Mm, it hurts a little bit to, to give that because it's a value. And then that shows to God how much you value him. Brethren, what are we willing to sacrifice? In our lives, we've seen what Jesus was willing to do. And not just in his death. In his own life, he gave his time, he gave his patience, he overlooked insults, he gave his best. The sacrifices he gave had value. What about us? You know, God doesn't require that we give him everything we own. But he does require that we sacrifice. We gave an offering this morning. He does require that we sacrifice. We give him our time. He doesn't say we have to give 100% of our time, right? We have to work. We have to take care of other things. We have to do our chores. We have to make sure that uh, those under our hand are, are taken care of. We have a lot of latitude on how to spend the blessings he gives us, but he does expect to, us to sacrifice at certain times to sacrifice time. For him, for example, doesn't he? What do we own of high value? Well, you could say money. Okay, well, certainly. Uh, that's one thing of value. But frankly, when it comes to our relationships with God and with other people, other things have a lot of value too, don't they? Maybe even more value. Our time, our attention, our focus, our service. Remember the story of the poor widow who gave two mites? And Jesus was watching as, as they were giving an offering in the temple. And she gave two, two little coins. And she, she, he said that she has given more than everyone else. Why? Because they gave of their abundance. Maybe they didn't even feel it. Maybe they didn't even, didn't even register because they had an abundance. It's not wrong to have an abundance. And he's not requiring us to give us everything we have. 
but he was making the point that this poor widow had an attitude of sacrifice because what she gave hurt a little bit, a lot, actually. And God is looking for an attitude of sacrifice. Again, not, don't misunderstand me. Not necessarily that we give up everything we have, but we, when we give, we give of value. Something that is important to us. And that gets God's attention. <clears throat> the king of the universe already sacrificed everything he had for us. And the father sacrificed everything he had for us. When Jesus Christ came to this earth and became a human being and then gave his life. The question is, what are we willing to sacrifice? Are we becoming a living sacrifice? Let's break this down as we think about some practical takeaways. We're talking big picture here, huge picture, but we need some doable things that can help us as we move forward in having this habit and way of thinking of living a life of sacrifice. What are some things that can take us down that road? Well, let's ask several questions. Number one, can we sacrifice a little bit of our time every day to know God better? Can we sacrifice a little bit of our time every day to know God better? What do I mean in study and prayer? What do I mean at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day? God doesn't expect us to pray all day long. We wouldn't get any work done. We, we need to work. We need to take care of our duties. But he does expect us to sacrifice some of our time at critical times in the day. And frankly, crucial times are the morning, sets the course for the day, and the end of the day, wraps up the day. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. <clears throat> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How do we come to know God except by talking to him and listening to him? And you know, it takes a sacrifice of time, doesn't it? And oftentimes maybe... Uh, our, you know, having a, our prayer and our study and taking the time to do it, maybe a lot of times it doesn't feel like a great sacrifice because we're in the pattern of it. But you know there are times when it's like, oh, I don't, don't feel like it right now. Or my mind is going somewhere else and I really would rather be doing something else. And we have to wrestle our mind down and it is a sacrifice to spend a little bit of time Getting to know God better, isn't it? But when we sacrifice something of value, and it hurts a little bit, God sees an attitude that pleases him. He sees that we think he's important. He thought we were important. He sacrificed everything. Jesus did as well. Our time has value. Sacrificing a little bit of it every day shows God we value him. Now, of course, uh, life sometimes is different in different stages. We've talked about this before. Mothers of small children, oftentimes they're only, you're only struggling to get in a few snatches of prayer here or there. And sometimes when you're praying and the door opens and a little one comes in and crawls up on your head and sticks their finger in your nose. And it's hard to, hard to focus, you know, in and, and your prayer. It's understood there are times when our time may be more limited because of little ones and that sort of thing. But the point is, whoever we are, we need to keep contact with God and read his word. And we may need to make a little sacrifice 
of our time every day to do that. Number two, number two, can we sacrifice a little food occasionally to draw closer to God? Can we sacrifice a little food occasionally to draw closer to God? Mark chapter 9 and verse 29. This is a story of a, of a, a healing, uh, actually, I think, casting out of a, a demon by uh, Jesus. His disciples could not cast this demon out, and uh, he came and, and did cast it out. And we'll just drop down to the end, verse 8, 28. When he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Verse 29, so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. There is something about fasting that helps us draw near to God and helps us gain spiritual power. And and what is that? Maybe it's that we're having to sacrifice something that we like, and we like food, right? Our stomach aches when we're fasting. And we can tell, we can feel that we're giving something up. And oftentimes when, when you plan a fast, it seems like everything and anything will get in your way, you know, to completing your fast. I think Satan knows what we're trying to do. We're trying to draw near to, to God. And so he's going to throw any obstacle and distraction in, in front of us. And, but brethren, when we take the time to fast, to set aside time to take a little bit of our food, our, a few meals out of the way, we're sacrificing. And there is power in that, not of ourselves, but in drawing near to God. Can we sacrifice a little food occasionally to draw closer to God? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Well, I think we know the answer. Number three. Number three. Can we sacrifice our access to sinful behavior? Can we sacrifice our access to sinful behavior? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. We've talked about this already during these days, but these days are about getting rid of sin. And if there is sin in our life, we need to sacrifice our access to it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. In other words, be willing to sacrifice an eye. Not literally, not plucking our eye out. You know, we understand that. But, but be willing to sacrifice access to that sin in order to be in God's kingdom. Verse 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. You know, God says, look, you need to resist sin, you need to overcome sin, but all, all too often we, we try to resist sin, but we don't put a system in place in our life that helps us keep away from sin. You know, if, if, we're, if we're trying to eat fewer chocolate M&Ms, um, the technique is not to put a big bowl of M&Ms in our kitchen table, Right? And we walk by it all the time. That's not going to help us to be able to overcome uh, eating chocolate M&Ms. We're setting ourselves up to fail. But brethren, think about it. The way our world is set up, isn't it true? That temptation is just a click away. Temptation is just a button away. It's just a link away. And if we're going to overcome the world... If we're going to stay away from sin, we're going to cut, have to cut off access to sin. We're going to have to flee from it. You know, the world says that, that um, you, you get as close to the cliff, you get as close to the cliff without falling over the cliff. And see how close you can get. Well, that's just plain foolishness. You know, anyone who would be 
a hiking or a mountaineer and, 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 and would see how, how close, let's play a game. Who can get the closest to the cliff without falling over? Well, once you're that close, it doesn't take much to have a slip and you're dead, right? God says flee fornication. The world says you're weak if you flee. God says, no, you're strong. If you cut off access to sin. Brethren, as we think about our lives and examine ourselves and find sin, we need to to work on ways of setting up, eliminating access and setting up ourselves to, to succeed. It's going to help us get into the kingdom and it's worth sacrificing for. What are we willing to sacrifice in order to be in God's kingdom? Number four. Number four. Can we sacrifice our time to serve others? Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This really dovetails with also what Mr. Strain was talking about this morning. Philippians chapter 2 and verse... Uh, Verse 1, this is the context of what we were reading before, but he says in verse 1, Therefore, if if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. You know, there may come a time when we have to sacrifice for one another in ways that we aren't yet. As things get worse, we may really need to rely on each other in in ways that we don't foresee yet. But how do we sacrifice a little bit for one another now? Well, there are many ways, and, and there are many people who are sacrificing already here and in other congregations around the country, around the world, in, in serving local congregations, in, in calling, in writing notes, in visiting and helping when people are in the hospital or sick. You know, and God sees that. He, he knows it's a sacrifice of time. As we are able, you know, showing hospitality, having people over to our, to our house. But let's talk just briefly about one thing, and, and that can be fellowship at church. You know, it's so easy to talk to the people that we know the best. It's so easy to talk to those who we're closest to. It's so easy to talk to those that, that are our same age or our same social group. but maybe we can sacrifice a little bit and talk to some others. Maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable to talk to someone that we don't know as well, or we wouldn't necessarily click with as well. But maybe that's part of sacrificing. Now, not in a great heroic way, and as Mr. Strain was saying, you know, not sounding a trumpet before us as we go, Look, I'm sacrificing. I'm talking to you. That won't go over very well. On the other hand, brethren, oftentimes don't we go the easy path if we don't force ourselves to say, you know what, this other person over there, they don't have anyone to talk to right now. I don't know them that well. They're not in my age group. They're not in my social group. But I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of my personal needs or my personal whims. And I'm going to share my life with them. And I'm going to get to know them. And maybe I'll actually be able to pray for them better. Or maybe I'll even say a word that I don't even know but will be encouraging to them. And I don't know unless I do that. Can we sacrifice for one another? 
Or do we just stay within our groove and stay within those we're comfortable with and we all pat each other on the back and we all stay happy and we're not sacrificing for those who need it? A little bit of sacrifice at a time. Number five, the last one. Can we sacrifice a little bit of device time for the health of our attention? How much are we guarding our attention in this time of extreme technology? How much do we monitor the health of our attention? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, we're living in a strange world of technological wonders. And our world is filled with technology. And the younger we are, the more we're immersed in it. The younger we are, the more we use it as a a, a natural thing. We're native users, right, of technology. The problem is... We can get sucked into it. The problem is that as we read, as we, the founders, the, those who are the, sitting in the boardrooms and talking about strategies, they don't really want our money. They want our attention because they know that if they, they make one sale of money, advertising, that's one sale. But if they can hook our attention... If they can get us in a habit of coming back again and again and again and again, they've got a lifer. They've got someone that they can go back to over and over and over and over again and sell whatever they want. Do we understand just how much there are carnal people who are strategizing to control our attention? And do we sacrifice that a little bit from time to time and say, you know what, I'm going to put my phone down. And I'm going to talk to the people around me. And I'm going to share experiences with people as opposed to just being on this merry-go-round of technology. Am I saying get off it entirely? No. What I'm saying is developing the habit of being willing to sacrifice a little bit for the health of our attention. So we're not controlled by this world. And in the process, we're going to be learning, we're going to be exercising, we're going to be developing the habit of being a living sacrifice. You know, over in Philippians chapter 3... And verse 7, Paul was an amazing person. Paul had done so many things in his life before he was converted. Paul had a lot to boast about. And, And what was the summation of all the things he had done after he was converted? How did he see his past life? Let's read it. Verse 7, Philippians 3 and verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. I think the King James says dung. You know what that means? Do do we need to be a little more graphic? It's manure. It's waste. It's refuse. It's garbage. That's what... Paul said everything that he had done, everything he had accumulated, he was willing to sacrifice it in place of what Christ was offering, what God is offering. And in comparison, that's the way he began to see it. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Would you say Paul was willing 
to sacrifice for God's kingdom. And yet, he had done a lot in his life. He had accumulated a lot in his life. He saw the value of being willing to sacrifice. And what a profound example he became for us. When we see what's being held out for us, the inheritance, being joint heirs with Christ. Let's turn over in conclusion to Genesis chapter 20. Because there's a profound story here back in the Old Testament as we think about sacrificing. And you know, brethren, especially if we have children and we're teaching and raising children, we have to be careful when we think about the issue of sacrifice because if we're not careful, we can, we can be complaining to them about how much we've sacrificed. And we can be complaining to them about how hard God's way of life is and how rough we have it, how much sacrificing we do. And, and if we focus on that, are they going to want to follow in our tracks? Or at some point, do we have to try to convey to them, look at what God is offering us. Look at what God is holding out for us. Yes, we have to sacrifice, but wow, in comparison, everything in this life is like giving up a bowl of stew. A bowl of stew. Have I heard that somewhere? Remember the story of Esau and Jacob? We need to convey that to our children, that God's way is worth it. And anything we give up in this life, it's okay. Because God's way is so much more valuable. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 27. The story of Esau and Jacob is so tragic. These two boys who were, had such a rivalry back and forth, which has continued to this day from their descendants. But it says in verse 27, So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau came, said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. Wow. Where did that come from? He upped the ante, didn't he? And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? And Jacob repeated it. He said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. He ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. What a tragic decision Esau made. And undoubtedly regretted it the rest of his life. And no doubt the animosity between the Jews and others who want to destroy them and drive them into the sea is a result of what happened here. Of not seeing the value of his birthright. Not seeing the value of his inheritance. What was in his hand, not seeing the importance of sacrificing a little bit in this life, in this case, a bowl of soup, in order to have a future. Brethren, what are we willing to sacrifice? As we close these Days of Unleavened Bread and we think about the lessons we've learned, let's make sure that we're applying the lessons that God has taught us, that has shown us, we've heard about, we've listened to, we've been reading about. Let's make sure we're making good decisions, we're following in the footsteps of our Savior, and frankly, living a life of being a living sacrifice. 
You know, the measly bowl of soup symbolizes everything that we have in this life. And if we can make a parallel, Satan the devil is offering us every day a bowl of soup. I don't want to correlate Satan with Jacob. Jacob turned out to be a really good guy. At this point in his life, he was not on track. And he was a deceiver. But Satan the devil every day is offering us a bowl of soup in return for our inheritance, in exchange for our inheritance. Let's sacrifice the bowl of soup. And let's grab on to our inheritance in God's kingdom forever. Again, what are you willing to sacrifice?